Chapter Twenty of Marius the Epicurean, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marius the Epicurean, Volume Two, by Walter Pater. Chapter Twenty: Two Curious Houses. One. Guests. Your old men shall dream dreams. A nature like that of Marius, composed in about equal parts of instincts almost physical, and of slowly accumulated intellectual judgments, was perhaps even less susceptible than other men's characters of essential change. And yet the experience of that fortunate hour, seeming to gather into one central act of vision all the deeper impressions his mind had ever received, did not leave him quite as he had been. For his mental view, at least, it changed measurably the world about him, of which he was still indeed a curious spectator, but which looked further off, was weaker in its hold, and in a sense less real to him than ever. It was as if he viewed it through a diminishing glass. And the permanency of this change he could note some years later, when it happened that he was a guest at a feast in which the various exciting elements of Roman life, its physical and intellectual accomplishments, its frivolity and far-fetched elegances, its strange mystic essays after the unseen, were elaborately combined. The great Apuleius, the literary ideal of his boyhood, had arrived in Rome, was now visiting Tusculum, at the house of their common friend, a certain aristocratic poet who loved every sort of superiorities, and Marius was favoured with an invitation to a supper given in his honour. It was with a feeling of half-humorous concession to his own early boyish hero-worship, yet with some sense of superiority in himself, seeing his old curiosity grown now almost to indifference when on the point of satisfaction at last, and upon a juster estimate of its object, that he mounted to the little town on the hillside, the footways of which were so many flights of easy-going steps gathered round a single great house, under the shadow of the haunted ruins of Cicero's villa on the wooded heights. He found a touch of weirdness in the circumstance, that in so romantic a place he had been bidden to meet the writer who was come to seem almost like one of the personages in his own fiction. As he turned now and then to gaze at the evening scene through the tall narrow openings of the street, up which the cattle were going home slowly from the pastures below, the Alban mountains stretched between the great walls of the ancient houses seemed close at hand, a screen of vaporous dun purple against the setting sun, with those waves of surpassing softness in the boundary lines which indicate volcanic formation. The coolness of the little brown market-place, for profit of which even the working people in long file through the olive gardens were leaving the plain for the night, was grateful after the heats of Rome. Those wild country figures, clad in every kind of fantastic patchwork, stained by wind and weather, fortunately enough for the eye, under that significant light, inclined him to poetry. And it was a very delicate poetry of its kind that seemed to enfold him. As passing into the poet's house he paused for a moment to glance back toward the heights above, whereupon the numerous cascades of the precipitous garden of the villa, framed in the doorway of the hall, fell into a harmless picture, in its place among the pictures within, and scarcely more real than they, a landscape piece, in which the power of water, plunging into what unseen depths, done to the life, was pleasant, and without its natural terrors. At the further end of this bland apartment, fragrant with the rare woods of the old inlaid panelling, the falling of aromatic oil from the ready lighted lamps, the iris root clinging to the dresses of the guests as with odours from the altars of the gods, the supper table was spread in all the daintiness characteristic of the agreeable petit maitre, who entertained. He was already most carefully dressed, but like Marshal Stella, perhaps consciously meant to change his attire once and again during the banquet. In the last instance, for an ancient vesture, object of much rivalry among the young men of fashion at that great sale of the imperial wardrobes, a toga of altogether lost hue and texture, 
he wore it with a grace which became the leader of a thrilling movement then on foot for the restoration of that disused garment in which laying aside the customary evening dress all the visitors were requested to appear setting off the delicate sinuosities and well-disposed golden ways of its folds with harmoniously tinted flowers the opulent sunset blending pleasantly with artificial light fell across the quiet ancestral effigies of old consular dignitaries along the wide floor strewn with sawdust of sandalwood and lost itself in the heap of cool coronals lying ready for the foreheads of the guests on a sideboard of old citron the crystal vessels darkened with old wine the hues of early autumn fruit mulberries pomegranates and grapes that had long been hanging under careful protection upon the vines were almost as much a feast for the eye as the dusky fires of the rare twelve-petalled roses a favorite animal white as snow brought by one of the visitors purred its way gracefully among the wine cups coaxed onward from place to place by those at table as they reclined easily on their cushions of german eater-down spread over the long-legged carved couches a highly refined modification of the akarama a musical performance during supper for the diversion of the guests was presently heard hovering round the place soothingly and so unobtrusively that the company could not guess and did not like to ask whether or not it had been designed by their entertainer they inclined on the whole to think it some wonderful peasant music peculiar to that wild neighborhood turning as it did now and then to a solitary reed note like a bird's while it wandered into the distance it wandered quite away at last as darkness with a bolder lamplight came on and made way for another sort of entertainment an odd rapid phantasmal glitter advancing from the garden by torchlight defined itself as it came nearer into a dance of young men in armor arrived at length in a portico open to the supper chamber they contrived that their mechanical march movements should fall out into a kind of highly expressive dramatic action and with the utmost possible emphasis of dumb motion their long swords weaving a silvery network in the air they danced the death of paris the young commodus already an adept in these matters who had condescended to welcome the eminent apuleius at the banquet had mysteriously dropped from his place to take his share in the performance and at its conclusion reappeared still wearing the dainty accoutrements of paris including a breastplate composed entirely of overlapping tiger's claws skilfully gilt the youthful prince had lately assumed the dress of manhood on the return of the emperor for a brief visit from the north putting up his hair in imitation of nero in a golden box dedicated to capitoline jupiter his likeness to aurelius his father was become in consequence more striking than ever and he had one source of genuine interest in the great literary guest of the occasion in that the latter was the fortunate possessor of a monopoly for the exhibition of wild beasts and gladiatorial shows in the province of carthage where he resided still after all complaisance to the perhaps somewhat crude tastes of the emperor's son it was felt that with a guest like apuleius whom they had come prepared to entertain as veritable connoisseurs the conversation should be learned and superior and the host at last deftly led his company round to literature by way of bindings elegant rolls of manuscript from his fine library of ancient greek books passed from hand to hand about the table it was a sign for the visitors themselves to draw their own choicest literary curiosities from their bags as their contribution to the banquet and one of them a famous reader choosing his lucky moment delivered in tenor voice the piece which follows with a preliminary query as to whether it could indeed be the composition of lucian of samosata understood to be the great mocker of that day what sound was that socrates asked chiapheron it came from the beach under the cliff yonder and seemed a long way off and how melodious it was was it a bird i wonder i thought all sea-birds were songless ay a sea-bird answered socrates a bird called the halcyon and has a note full of plaining and tears there is an old story people tell of it it was a mortal woman once daughter of aeolus god of the winds ceyx the son of the morning star wedded her in her early maidenhood 
the son was not less fair than the father and when it came to pass that he died the crying of the girl as she lamented his sweet usage was just that and some while after as heaven willed she was changed into a bird floating now on bird's wings over the sea she seeks her lost cx there since she was not able to find him after long wandering over the land that then is the halcyon the kingfisher said Caeferon. i never heard a bird like it before it has truly a plaintive note what kind of bird is it socrates not a large bird though she has received large honour from the gods on account of her singular conjugal affection for whensoever she makes her nest a law of nature brings round what is called halcyon's weather days distinguishable among all others for their serenity though they come sometimes amid the storms of winter days like to-day see how transparent is the sky above us and how motionless the sea like a smooth mirror true a halcyon day indeed and yesterday was the same but tell me socrates what is one to think of those stories which have been told from the beginning of birds changed into mortals and mortals into birds to me nothing seems more incredible dear caeferon said socrates methinks we are but half blind judges of the impossible and the possible we try the question by the standards of our human faculty which avails neither for true knowledge nor for faith nor vision therefore many things seem to us impossible which are really easy many things unattainable which are within our reach partly through inexperience partly through the childishness of our minds for in truth every man even the oldest of us is like a little child so brief and babyish are the years of our life in comparison of eternity then how can we who comprehend not the faculties of gods and of the heavenly host tell whether aught of that kind be possible or no what a tempest you saw three days ago one trembles but to think of the lightning the thunderclaps the violence of the wind you might have thought the whole world was going to ruin and then after a little came this wonderful serenity of weather which has continued till to-day what do you think the greater and more difficult thing to do to exchange the disorder of that irresistible whirlwind to a clarity like this and be calm the whole world again or refashion the form of a woman into that of a bird we can teach even little children to do something of that sort to take wax or clay and mould out of the same material many kinds of form one after another without difficulty and it may be that to the deity whose power is too vast for comparison with ours all processes of that kind are manageable and easy how much wider is the whole circle of heaven than thyself wider than thou canst express among ourselves also how vast the difference we may observe in men's degrees of power to you and me and many another like us many things are impossible which are quite easy to others for those who are unmusical to play on the flute to read or write for those who have not yet learned is no easier than to make birds of women or women of birds from the dumb and lifeless egg nature moulds her swarms of winged creatures aided as some will have it by a divine and secret art in the wide air around us she takes from the honeycomb a little memberless live thing she brings it wings and feet brightens and beautifies it with quaint variety of colours and lo the bee in her wisdom making honey worthy of the gods it follows that we mortals being altogether of little account able wholly to discern no great matter sometimes not even a little one for the most part at a loss regarding what happens even with ourselves may hardly speak with security as to what may be the powers of the immortal gods concerning kingfisher or nightingale yet the glory of thy mythus as my fathers bequeathed it to me o tearful songstress that will i to hand on to my children and tell it often to my wives xanthippa and myrto the story of thy pious love to cx and of thy melodious hymns and above all of the honour thou hast with the gods the reader's well-turned periods seem to stimulate almost uncontrollably the eloquent stirrings of the eminent man of letters then present the impulse to speak masterfully was visible before the recital was well over in the moving lines about his mouth by no means designed as detractors were wont to say 
simply to display the beauty of his teeth. One of the company, expert in his humours, made ready to transcribe what he would say, the sort of things of which a collection was then forming, the Florida, or flowers, so to call them, he was apt to let fall by the way. No impromptu ventures at random, but rather elaborate carved ivories of speech, drawn at length out of the rich treasure-house of a memory stored with such, and as with a fine savour of old musk about them. Certainly in this case, as Marius thought, it was worth while to hear a charming writer speak. Discussing quite in our modern way the peculiarities of those suburban views, especially the sea views, of which he was a professed lover, he was also every inch a priest of Esculapius, patronal god of Carthage. There was a piquancy in his rococo, very African, and as it were perfumed personality, though he was well nigh sixty years old, a mixture there of the sort of platonic spiritualism which can speak of the soul of man as but a sojourner in the prison of the body. A blending of that which such a relish for merely bodily graces as availed to set the fashion in matters of dress, deportment, accent, and the like, nay, was something also which reminded Marius of the vein of coarseness he had found in the Golden Book. All this made the total impression he conveyed a very uncommon one. Marius did not wonder, as he watched him speaking, that people freely attributed to him many of the marvellous adventures he had recounted in that famous romance, over and above the wildest version of his own actual story, his extraordinary marriage, his religious initiations, his acts of mad generosity, his trial as a sorcerer. But a sign came from the imperial prince that it was time for the company to separate. He was entertaining his immediate neighbours at the table with a trick from the streets, tossing his olives in rapid succession into the air, and catching them as they fell between his lips. His dexterity in this performance made the mirth around him noisy, disturbing the sleep of the furry visitor. The learned party broke up, and Marius withdrew, glad to escape into the open air. The courtesans in their large wigs of false blonde hair were lurking for the guests, with groups of curious idlers. A great conflagration was visible in the distance. Was it in Rome, or in one of the villages of the country? Pausing for a few minutes on the terrace to watch it, Marius was for the first time able to converse intimately with Apuleius, and in this moment of confidence the Illuminist himself, with locks so carefully arranged and seeming so full of affectations, almost like one of those light women there, dropped a veil as it were, and appeared, though still permitting the play of a certain element of theatrical interest in his bizarre tenants, to be ready to explain and defend his position reasonably. For a moment his fantastic foppishness and his pretensions to ideal vision seemed to fall into some intelligible congruity with each other. In truth, it was the platonic idealism as he conceived it, which for him literally animated and gave him so lively an interest in this world of the purely outward aspects of men and things. Did material things, such things as they had around them all evening, really need apology for being there to interest one at all? were not all visible objects, the whole material world indeed, according to the consistent testimony of philosophy in many forms, full of souls. Embarrassed, perhaps, partly imprisoned, but still eloquent souls? Certainly the contemplative philosophy of Plato, with its figurative imagery and epilogue, its manifold aesthetic colouring, its measured eloquence, its music for the outward ear, had been like Plato's old master himself, a two-sided or two-coloured thing. Apuleius was a Platonist. Only for him the ideals of Plato were no creatures of logical abstraction, but in the very truth informing souls in every type and variety of sensible things. Those noises in the house all supper-time, sounding through the tables and along the walls, were they only startings in the old rafters at the impact of the music, and laughter, or rather importunities, of the secondary selves, the true unseen selves of the persons, nay, of the very things around, essaying to break through their frivolous, merely transitory surfaces, to remind one of abiding essentials beyond them which might have their say, their judgment to give by and by, when the shifting of the meats and drinks at life's table would be over. 
And was not this the true significance of the Platonic doctrine, a hierarchy of divine beings associating themselves with particular things and places, for the purpose of mediating between God and man, man who does but need due attention on his part to become aware of his celestial company, filling the air about him, thick as motes in the sunbeam, for the glance of sympathetic intelligence he casts through it. Two kinds there are of animated beings, he exclaimed gods entirely differing from men in the infinite distance of their abode since one part of them only is seen by our blunted vision those mysterious stars in the eternity of their existence in the perfection of their nature infected by no contact with ourselves and men dwelling on the earth with frivolous and anxious minds with infirm and mortal members with variable fortunes laboring in vain taken altogether and in their whole species perhaps eternal but severally quitting the scene in irresistible succession. What then? Has nature connected itself together by no bond, allowed itself to be thus crippled and split into the divine and human elements? And you will say to me, if so it be that man is thus entirely exiled from the immortal gods, that all communication is denied him, that not one of them occasionally visits us as a shepherd his sheep, to whom shall I address my prayers? Whom shall I invoke as the helper of the unfortunate, the protector of the good? Well, there are certain divine powers of a middle nature through whom our aspirations are conveyed to the gods, and theirs to us. Passing between the inhabitants of earth and heaven, they carry from one to the other prayers and bounties, supplication and assistance, being a kind of interpreters. This interval of the air is full of them. Through them all revelations, miracles, magical processes are effected. For specially appointed members of this order have their special provinces, with a ministry according to the disposition of each. They go to and fro without fixed habitation, or dwell in men's houses. Just then a companion's hand laid in the darkness on the shoulder of the speaker carried him away, and the discourse broke off suddenly. Its singular intimations, however, were sufficient to throw back on this strange evening, in all its detail, the dance, the readings, the distant fire, a kind of allegoric expression, gave it the character of one of those famous platonic figures or apologues, which had then been in fact under discussion. When Marius recalled its circumstances, he seemed to hear once more that voice of genuine conviction, pleading from amidst a scene at best of elegant frivolity, for so boldly mystical a view of man and his position in the world. For a moment, but only for a moment, as he listened, the trees had seemed, as of old, to be growing close against the sky. Yes, the reception of theory, of hypothesis, of beliefs, did depend a great deal on temperament. They were, so to speak, mere equivalents of temperament. A celestial ladder, a ladder from heaven to earth, that was the assumption which the experience of Apuleius had suggested to him. It was what, in different forms, certain persons in every age had instinctively supposed. They would be glad to find their supposition accredited by the authority of a grave philosophy. Marius, however, yearning not less than they, in that hard world of Rome, and below its unpeopled sky, for the trace of some celestial wing across it, must still object that they assumed the thing with too much facility, too much of self-complacency. And his second thought was, that to indulge but for an hour fantasies, fantastic visions of that sort, only left the actual world more lonely than ever. For him, certainly, and for his solace, the little godship for whom the rude countryman and unconscious Platonist trimmed his twinkling lamp, would never slip from the bark of these immemorial olive-trees. No, not even in the wildest moonlight. For himself it was clear he must still hold by what his eyes really saw. Only he had to concede also that the very boldness of such theory bore witness, at least, to a variety of human disposition, and a consequent variety of mental view, which might, who can tell, be correspondent to, be defined by, and define, varieties of facts, of truths, just beyond the veil, regarding the world all alike, had actually before them as their original premise or starting point, 
a world wider perhaps in its possibilities than all possible fancies concerning it. End of chapter 20. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 21 of Marius the Epicurean, Volume 2, by Walter Pater. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Two Curious Houses. 2. The Church in Cecilia's House. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Cornelius had certain friends in or near Rome, whose household, to Marius, as he pondered now and again what might be the determining influences of that peculiar character, presented itself as possibly its main secret, the hidden source from which the beauty and strength of a nature, so persistently fresh in the midst of a somewhat jaded world, might be derived. But Marius had never yet seen these friends, and it was almost by accident that the veil of reserve was at last lifted, and with strange contrast to his visit to the poet's villa at Tusculum, he entered another curious house. The house in which she lives, says that mystical German writer quoted once before, is for the orderly soul, which does not live on blindly before her, but is ever, out of her passing experiences, building and adorning the parts of a many-roomed abode for herself, only an expansion of the body, as the body, according to the philosophy of Swedenborg, is but a process, an expansion of the soul. For such an orderly soul, as life proceeds, all sorts of delicate affinities establish themselves between herself and the doors and passageways, the lights and shadows of her outward dwelling place, until she may seem incorporate with it, until at last, in the entire expressiveness of what is outward, there is for her to speak properly, between outward and inward, no longer any distinction at all, and the light which creeps at a particular hour on a particular picture or space upon the wall, the scent of flowers in the air at a particular window, become to her not so much apprehended objects, as themselves powers of apprehension and doorways to things beyond, the germ or rudiment of certain new faculties, by which she, dimly yet surely, apprehends a matter lying beyond her actually attained capacities of spirit and sense. So it must needs be in a world which is itself, we may think, together with that bodily tent or tabernacle, only one of many vestures for the clothing of the pilgrim soul, to be left by her surely as if on the wayside, worn out one by one, as it was from her indeed they borrowed what momentary value or significance they had. The two friends were returning to Rome from a visit to a country house, where again a mixed company of guests had been assembled. Marius, for his part, a little weary of gossip, and those sparks of ill-tempered rivalry which would seem sometimes to be the only sort of fire the intercourse of people in general society can strike out of them. A mere reaction upon this, as they started in the clear morning, made their companionship, at least for one of them, hardly less tranquilizing than the solitude he so much valued. Something in the southwest wind, combining with their own intention, favoured increasingly as the hours wore on a serenity like that marius had felt once before in journeying over the great plain towards tiber a serenity that was to-day brotherly amity also and seemed to draw into its own charmed circle whatever was then present to eye or ear while they talked or were silent together and all petty irritations and the like shrank out of existence or kept certainly beyond its limits the natural fatigue of the long journey overcame them quite suddenly at last when they were still about two miles distant from rome the seemingly endless line of tombs and cypresses had been visible for hours against the sky towards the west and it was just where a cross-road from the latin way fell into the appian that cornelius halted at a doorway in a long low wall the outer wall of some villa courtyard it might be supposed as if at liberty to enter and rest there a while he held the door open for his companion to enter also if he would with an expression as he lifted the latch which seemed to ask marius apparently shrinking from a possible intrusion would you like to see it was he willing to look upon that the seeing of which might define yes define the critical turning point in his days the little doorway in this long low wall admitted them in fact into the quarter garden of a villa 
disposed in one of those abrupt natural hollows which gives its character to the country in this place the house itself with all its dependent buildings the spaciousness of which surprised marius as he entered being thus wholly concealed from passengers along the road all around in those well-ordered precincts were the quiet signs of wealth and of a noble taste a taste indeed chiefly evidenced in the selection and juxtaposition of the material it had to deal with consisting almost exclusively of the remains of older art here arranged and harmonized with effects both as regards colour and form so delicate as to seem really derivative from some finer intelligence in these matters than lay within the resources of the ancient world it was the old way of true renaissance being indeed the way of nature with her roses the divine way with the body of man perhaps with his soul conceiving the new organism by no sudden and abrupt creation but rather by the action of a new principle upon elements all of which had in truth already lived and died many times the fragments of older architecture the mosaics the spiral columns the precious cornerstones of immemorial building had put on by such juxtaposition a new and singular expressiveness an air of grave thought of an intellectual purpose in itself aesthetically very seductive lastly urban tree had taken possession spreading their seed bells and light branches just astir in the trembling air above the ancient garden wall against the wide realms of sunset and from the first they could hear singing the singing of children mainly it would seem and of a new kind so novel indeed in its effect as to bring suddenly to the recollection of marius flavian's early essays toward a new world of poetic sound it was the expression not altogether of mirth yet of some wonderful sort of happiness the blithe self-expansion of a joyful soul in people upon whom some all-subduing experience had wrought heroically and who still remembered on this bland afternoon the hour of a great deliverance his old native susceptibility to the spirit the special sympathies of places above all to any hieratic or religious significance they might have was at its liveliest as marius still encompassed by that peculiar singing and still amid the evidences of a grave discretion all around him passed into the house that intelligent seriousness about life the absence of which had ever seemed to remove those who lacked it into some strange species wholly alien from himself accumulating all the lessons of his experience since those first days at white nights was as it were translated here as if in designed congruity with his favorite precepts of the power of physical vision into an actual picture if the true value of souls is in proportion to what they can admire marius was just then an acceptable soul as he passed through the various chambers great and small one dominant thought increased upon him the thought of chaste women and their children of all the various affections of family life under its most natural conditions yet developed as if in devout imitation of some sublime new type of it into large controlling passions there reigned throughout an order and purity an orderly disposition as if by way of making ready for some gracious spousals the place itself was like a bride adorned for her husband and its singular cheerfulness the abundant light everywhere the sense of peaceful industry of which he received a deep impression though without precisely reckoning wherein it resided as he moved on rapidly were in forcible contrast just at first to the place to which he was next conducted by cornelius still with a sort of eager hurried half-troubled reluctance and as if he forbore the explanation which might well be looked for by his companion an old flower garden in the rear of the house set here and there with a venerable olive tree a picture in pensive shade and fiery blossom as transparent under that afternoon light as the old miniature painter's work on the walls of the chambers within was bounded towards the west by a low grass-grown hill a narrow opening cut in its steep side like a solid blackness there admitted marius and his gleaming leader into a hollow cavern or crypt neither more nor less in fact than the family burial place of the cecili to whom this residence belonged brought thus after an arrangement then becoming not unusual into immediate connection with the abode of the living 
in bold assertion of that instinct of family life which the sanction of the holy family was hereafter more and more to reinforce here in truth was the centre of the peculiar religious expressiveness of the sanctity of the entire scene that any person may at his own election constitute the place which belongs to him a religious place by the carrying of his dead into it had been a maxim of old roman law which it was reserved for the early christian societies like that established here by the piety of a wealthy roman matron to realize in all its consequences yet this was certainly unlike any cemetery marius had ever before seen most obviously in this that these people had returned to the older fashion of disposing of their dead by burial instead of burning originally a family sepulchre it was growing to a vast necropolis a whole township of the deceased by means of some free expansion of the family interest beyond its amplest natural limits that air of venerable beauty which characterized the house and its precincts above was maintained also here it was certainly with a great outlay of labor that these long apparently endless yet elaborately designed galleries were increasing so rapidly with their layers of beds or berths one above another cut on either side the pathway in the porous tufa through which all the moisture filters downwards leaving the parts above dry and wholesome all alike were carefully closed and with all the delicate costliness at command some with simple tiles of baked clay many with slabs of marble enriched by fair inscriptions marble taken in some cases from older pagan tombs the inscription sometimes a palimpsest the new epitaph being woven into the faded letters of an earlier one as in an ordinary roman cemetery an abundance of utensils for the worship or commemoration of the departed was disposed around incense lights flowers their flame or their freshness being relieved to the utmost by contrast with the coal-like blackness of the soil itself a volcanic sandstone cinder of burnt-out fires would they ever kindle again possess transform the place turning to an ashen pallor where at regular intervals an air-hole or luminaire let in a hard beam of clear but sunless light with the heavy sleepers row upon row within leaving a passage so narrow that only one visitor at a time could move along cheek to cheek with them the high wall seemed to shut one in into the great company of the dead only the long straight pathway lay before him opening however here and there into a small chamber around a broad table-like coffin or altar tomb adorned even more profusely than the rest as if for some anniversary observance clearly these people concurring in this with the special sympathies of marius himself had adopted the practice of burial from some peculiar feeling of hope they entertained concerning the body a feeling which in no irreverent curiosity he would fain have penetrated the complete and irreparable disappearance of the dead in the funeral fire so crushing to the spirits as he for one had found it had long since induced in him a preference for that other mode of settlement to the last sleep as having something about it more homelike and hopeful at least in outward seeming but whence the strange confidence that these handfuls of white dust would hereafter recompose themselves once more into exulting human creatures by what heavenly alchemy what reviving dew from above such as was certainly never again to reach the dead violets januarius agapetus felicitas martyrs refresh i pray you the soul of cecil of cornelius said an inscription one of many scratched like a passing sigh when it was still fresh in the mortar that had closed up the prison door all critical estimate of this bold hope as sincere apparently as it was audacious in its claim being set aside here at least carried further than ever before was that pious systematic commemoration of the dead which in its chivalrous refusal to forget or finally desert the helpless had ever counted with marius as the central exponent or symbol of all natural duty the stern soul of the excellent jonathan edwards applying the faulty theology of john calvin afforded him we know the vision of infants not a span long on the floor of hell every visitor to the catacombs must have observed in a very different theological connection the numerous children's graves there beds of infants but a span long indeed 
lowly prisoners of hope on these sacred floors. It was with great curiosity, certainly, that Marius considered them, decked in some instances with the favorite toys of their tiny occupants, toy soldiers, little chariot wheels, the entire paraphernalia of a baby house. And when he saw afterwards the living children, who sang and were busy above, sang their psalm, Laudate Pure Dominum, their very faces caught for him a sort of quaint unreality from the memory of those others, the children of the catacombs, but a little way below them. Here and there, mingling with the record of merely natural decease, and sometimes even at those children's graves, were the signs of violent death or martyrdom, proofs that some had loved not their lives unto the death, and the little red file of blood, the palm branch, the red flowers for their heavenly birthday. About one sepulchre in particular, distinguished in this way, and devoutly arrayed for what, by a bold paradox, was thus treated as natalitia, a birthday, the peculiar arrangements of the whole place visibly centred. And it was with a singular novelty of feeling like the dawning of a fresh order of experiences upon him, that standing beside those mournful relics snatched in haste from the common place of execution not many years before, Marius became, as by some gleam of foresight, aware of the whole force of evidence for a certain strange new hope, defining in its turn some new and weighty motive of action, which lay in death so tragic for the Christian superstition. Something of them he had heard indeed already. They seemed to him but one savagery the more, savagery self-provoked in a cruel and stupid world. And yet these poignant memorials seemed also to draw him onwards to-day, as if towards an image of some still more pathetic suffering in the remote background. Yes, the interest, the expression of the entire neighborhood was instinct with it, as with the savor of some priceless incense, penetrating the whole atmosphere, touching everything around with its peculiar sentiment, it seemed to make all this visible mortality, death's very self, ah! lovelier than any fable of old mythology had ever thought to render it, in the utmost limits of fantasy, and this in simple candor of feeling about a supposed fact. Peace, pax tecum, the word, the thought, was put forth everywhere, with images of hope snatched sometimes from that jaded pagan world, which had really afforded man so little of it from first to last, the various consoling images it had thrown off, of succor, of regeneration, of escape from the grave, Hercules wrestling with death for possession of Alcestis, Orpheus taming the wild beasts, the shepherd with his sheep, the shepherd carrying the sick lamb upon his shoulders. Yet these imageries, after all, it must be confessed, form but a slight contribution to the dominant effect of tranquil hope there, a kind of heroic cheerfulness and grateful expansion of heart, as with the sense again of some real deliverance, which seemed to deepen the longer one, lingered through these strange and awful passages. A figure partly pagan in character, yet most frequently repeated of all these visible parables, the figure of one just escaped from the sea, still clinging as for life to the shore in surprised joy, together with the inscription beneath it, seemed best to express the prevailing sentiment of the place. And it was just as he had puzzled out this inscription, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, that with no feeling of suddenness or change Marius found himself emerging again, like a later mystic traveller through similar dark places, quieted by hope into the daylight. There were still within the precincts of the house, still in possession of that wonderful singing, although almost in the open country with a great view of the Campagna before them, and the hills beyond. The orchard or meadow through which their path lay was already grey with twilight, though the western sky, where the greater stars were visible, was still afloat in crimson splendour. The colour of all earthly things seemed repressed by the contrast, yet with a sense of great richness lingering in their shadows. At that moment the voice of the singers, a voice of joy and health concentrated itself with solemn antistrophic movement into an evening or candle hymn hail heavenly light from his pure glory poured who is the almighty father heavenly blessed 
worthiest art thou at all times to be sung with undefiled tongue it was like the evening itself made audible its hopes and fears with the stars shining in the midst of it half above half below the level white mist dividing the light from the darkness came now the mistress of this place the wealthy roman matron left early a widow a few years before by cecilius confessor and saint with a certain antique severity in the gathering of the long mantle and with coy for veil folded decorously below the chin gray within gray to the mind of marius her temperate beauty brought reminiscences of the serious and virile character of the best female statuary of greece quite foreign however to any greek statuary was the expression of pathetic care with which she carried a little child at rest in her arms another a year or two older walked beside the fingers of one hand within her girdle she paused for a moment with a greeting for cornelius that visionary scene was the close the fitting close of the afternoon's strange experiences a few minutes later passing forward on his way along the public road he could have fancied it a dream the house of cecilia grouped itself besides that other curious house he had lately visited at tusculum and what a contrast was presented by the former in its suggestions of hopeful industry of immaculate cleanness of responsive affections all alike determined by that transporting discovery of some fact or series of facts in which the old puzzle of life had found its solution in truth one of his most characteristic and constant traits had ever been a certain longing for escape for some sudden relieving interchange across the very spaces of life it might be along which he had lingered most pleasantly for a lifting from time to time of the actual horizon it was like the necessity under which the painter finds himself to set a window or open doorway in the background of his picture or like a sick man's longing for northern coolness and the whispering willow trees amid the breathless evergreen forests of the south to some such effect had this visit occurred to him and through so slight an accident rome and roman life just then were come to seem like some stifling forest of bronze work transformed as if by malign enchantment out of the generations of living trees yet with roots in a deep downtrodden soil of poignant human susceptibilities in the midst of its suffocation that old longing for escape had been satisfied by this vision of the church in cecilia's house as never before it was still indeed according to the unchangeable law of his temperament to the eye to the visual faculty of the mind that those experiences appealed the peaceful light and shade the boys whose very faces seemed to sing the virginal beauty of the mother and her children but in his case what was thus visible constituted a moral or spiritual influence of a somewhat exigent and controlling character added anew to life a new element therein with which consistently with his own chosen maxim he must make terms the thirst for every kind of experience encouraged by a philosophy which taught that nothing was intrinsically great or small good or evil had ever been at strife in him with a hieratic refinement in which the boy priest survived prompting always the selection of what was perfect of its kind with subsequent loyal adherence of his soul thereto this had carried him along in continuous communion with ideals certainly realized in part either in the conditions of his own being or in the actual company about him above all in cornelius surely in this strange new society he had touched upon for the first time to-day in this strange family like a garden enclosed was the fulfilment of all the preferences the judgments of that half understood friend which of late years had been his protection so often amid the perplexities of life here it might be was if not the cure yet the solace or anodyne of his great sorrows of that constitutional sorrowfulness not peculiar to himself perhaps but which had made his life certainly like one long disease of the spirit merciful intention made itself known remedially here in the mere contact of the air like a soft touch upon aching flesh on the other hand he was aware that new responsibilities also might be awakened new and untried responsibilities a demand for something from him in return might this new vision like the malignant beauty of pagan medusa 
be exclusive of any admiring gaze upon anything but itself. At least, he suspected that, after the beholding of it, he could never again be altogether as he had been before. End of chapter 21 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 22 of Marius the Epicurean, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marius the Epicurean, Volume 2, by Walter Pater. Chapter 22. The Minor Peace of the Church. Faithful to the spirit of his early Epicurean philosophy and the impulse to surrender himself, in perfectly liberal inquiry about it, to anything that as a matter of fact attracted or impressed him strongly, Marius informed himself with much pains concerning the church in Cecilia's house, inclining at first to explain the peculiarities of that place by the establishment there of the scola, or common hall of one of those burial guilds, which then covered so much of the unofficial, and, as it might be called, subterranean enterprise of Roman society. And what he found, thus looking literally for the dead among the living, was the vision of a natural, a scrupulously natural love, transforming by some new gift of insight into the truth of human relationships, and under the urgency of some new motive by him so far unfathomable, all the conditions of life. He saw in all its primitive freshness and amid the lovely facts of its actual coming into the world as a reality of experience, that regenerate type of humanity, which centuries later Giotto and his successors down to the best and purest days of the young Raphael, working under conditions very friendly to the imagination, were to conceive as an artistic ideal. He felt there, felt amid the stirring of some wonderful new hope within himself, the genius, the unique power of Christianity. In exercise, then, as it has been exercised ever since, in spite of many hindrances, and under the most inopportune circumstances. Chastity, as he seemed to understand, the chastity of men and women amid all the conditions and with the results proper to such chastity, is the most beautiful thing in the world, and the truest conservation of that creative energy by which men and women were first brought into it. The nature of the family, for which the better genius of old Rome itself had sincerely cared, of the family and its appropriate affections, all that love of one's kindred by which obviously one does triumph in some degree over death, had never been so felt before. Here, surely, in its genial warmth, its jealous exclusion of all that was opposed to it, to its own immaculate naturalness in the head set around the sacred thing on every side, this development of the family did but carry forward and give effect to the purposes, the kindness of nature itself, friendly to man. As if by way of a due recognition of some immeasurable divine condescension manifest in a certain historic fact, its influence was felt more especially at those points which demanded some sacrifice of oneself, for the weak, for the aged, for little children, and even for the dead. And then for its constant outward token, its significant manner or index, it issued in a certain debonair grace, and a certain mystic attractiveness, a courtesy which made Marius doubt whether that famed Greek blitheness or gaiety or grace in the handling of life had been, after all, an unrivalled success. Contrasting with the incurable insipidity of even what was most exquisite in the higher Roman life, of what was still truest to the primitive soul of goodness amid its evil, the new creation he now looked on, as it were a picture beyond the craft of any master of old pagan beauty, had indeed all the appropriate freshness of a bride adorned for her husband. Things new and old seemed to be coming as if out of some goodly treasure-house. The brain full of science, the heart rich with various sentiment possessing with all this surprising healthfulness, this reality of heart. You would hardly believe, writes Pliny to his own wife, what a longing for you possesses me. Habit, that we have not been used to be a part, adds herein to the primary force of affection. It is this keeps me awake at night, fancying I see you beside me. That is why my feet take me unconsciously to your sitting-room at those hours when I was wont to visit you there. That is why I turn from the door of the empty chamber, sad and ill at ease, like an excluded lover. There is a real ideal from that family life, 
the protection of which had been the motive of so large a part of the religion of the Romans still surviving among them, as it survived also in Aurelius, his disposition and aims, and, spite of slanderous tongues, in the attained sweetness of his interior life. What Marius had been permitted to see was a realization of such life higher still, and with, yes, with a more effective sanction and motive than it had ever possessed before, in that fact, or series of facts, to be ascertained by those who would. The central glory of the reign of the Antonines was that society had attained in it, though very imperfectly, and for the most part by cumbrous effort of law, many of those ends to which Christianity went straight, with a sufficiency, the success of a direct and appropriate instinct. Pagan Rome, too, had its touching charity sermons on occasion of great public distress, its charity children in long file in memory of the elder Empress Faustina, its prototype under patronage of Esculapius, of the modern hospital for the sick on the island of St. Bartholomew. But what pagan charity was doing tardily, and, as if with the painful calculation of old age, the church was doing almost without thinking about it, with all the liberal enterprise of youth, because it was her very being thus to do. You fail to realize your own good intentions, she seems to say, to pagan virtue, pagan kindness. She identified herself with those intentions and advanced them with an unparalleled freedom and largeness. The gentle Seneca would have a reverent burial provided even for the dead body of a criminal. Yet when a certain woman collected for interment the insulted remains of Nero, the pagan world surmised that she must be a Christian. Only a Christian would have been likely to conceive so chivalrous a devotion towards mere wretchedness. We refuse to be witnesses even of a homicide commanded by the law, boasts the dainty conscience of a Christian apologist. We take no part in your cruel sports, nor in the spectacles of the amphitheatre, and we hold that to witness a murder is the same thing as to commit one. And there was another duty almost forgotten, the sense of which Rousseau brought back to the degenerate society of a later age. In an impassioned discourse, the sophist Favorinus counsels mothers to suckle their own infants, and there are Roman epitaphs erected to mothers which gratefully record this proof of natural affection as a thing then unusual. In this matter, too, what a sanction, what a provocative to natural duty, lay in the image discovered to Augustus by the Tiburtine Sibyl, amid the aurora of a new age, the image of the divine mother and the child, just then rising upon the world like the dawn. Christian belief again had presented itself as a great inspirer of chastity. Chastity in turn realized in the whole scope of its conditions, fortified that rehabilitation of peaceful labor, after the mind the pattern of the workmen of Galilee, which was another of the natural instincts of the Catholic Church as being indeed the long-desired initiator of a religion of cheerfulness, as a true lover of the industry, so to term it, the labor, the creation of God. And this severe yet genial assertion of the ideal of woman, of the family, of industry, of man's work and life so close to the truth of nature, was also in that charmed hour of the minor peace of the church, realized as an influence tending to beauty, to the adornment of life in the world. The sword in the world, the right eye plucked out, the right hand cut off, the spirit of reproach which those images express, and of which monasticism is the fulfillment, reflect one side only of the nature of the divine missionary of the New Testament. Opposed to, yet blent with this ascetic or militant character, is the function of the good shepherd, serene, blithe, and debonair, beyond the gentlest shepherd of Greek mythology, of a king under whom the beatific vision is realized of a reign of peace, peace of heart among men. Such aspect of the divine character of Christ rightly understood is indeed the final consummation of that bold and brilliant hopefulness in man's nature, which had sustained him so far through his immense labors, his immense sorrows, and of which pagan gaiety in the handling of life is but a minor achievement. Sometimes one, sometimes the other of those two contrasted aspects of its founder have in different ages and under the urgency of different human needs been at work also in the Christian church. Certainly in that brief peace of the church under the Antonines, the spirit of a pastoral security and happiness seems to have been largely expanded. There in the early church of Rome was to be seen, and on sufficiently reasonable grounds, that satisfaction and serenity, on a dispassionate survey of the facts of life, 
which all hearts had desired, though for the most part in vain, contrasting itself for Marius in particular very forcibly with the imperial philosopher's so heavy burden of unrelieved melancholy. It was Christianity in its humanity, or even its humanism, in its generous hopes for man, its common sense and alacrity of cheerful service, its sympathy with all creatures, its appreciation of beauty and daylight. The angel of righteousness, says the shepherd of Hermas, the most characteristic religious book of that age, its pilgrim's progress, the angel of righteousness is modest and delicate and meek and quiet. Take from thyself grief, for, as Hamlet will one day discover, tis the sister of doubt and ill-temper. Grief is more evil than any other spirit of evil, and is most dreadful to the servants of God, and beyond all spirits destroyeth man. For as when good news is come to one in grief, straightway he forgetteth his former grief, and no longer attendeth to anything except the good news which he hath heard, so do ye also, having received a renewal of your soul through the beholding of these good things. Put on therefore gladness that hath always favour before God, and is acceptable unto him, and delight thyself in it. For every man that is glad doeth the things that are good, and thinketh good thoughts, despising grief. Such were the commonplaces of this new people, among whom so much of what Marius had valued most in the old world seemed to be under renewal and further promotion. Some transforming spirit was at work to harmonize contrasts, to deepen expression, a spirit which, in its dealing with the elements of ancient life, was guided by a wonderful tact of selection, exclusion, juxtaposition, begetting thereby a unique effect of freshness, a grave yet wholesome beauty, because the world of sense, the whole outward world, was understood to set forth the veritable unction and royalty of a certain priesthood, and kingship of the soul within, among the prerogatives of which was a delightful sense of freedom. The reader may think, perhaps, that Marius, who Epicurean as he was, had his visionary aptitudes, by an inversion of one of Plato's peculiarities with which he was of course familiar, must have descended by foresight upon a later age than his own, and anticipated Christian poetry and art as they came to be under the influence of St. Francis of Assisi. But if he dreamed on one of those nights of the beautiful house of Cecilia, its lights and flowers, of Cecilia herself, moving among the lilies, with an enhanced grace as happens sometimes in healthy dreams, it was indeed hardly an anticipation. He had lighted, by one of the peculiar intellectual good fortunes of his life, upon a period when, even more than in the days of austere Assisis, which had proceeded and which were to follow it, the church was true for a moment, truer perhaps than she would ever be again, to that element of profound serenity in the soul of her founder, which reflected the eternal good will of God to men, in whom, according to the oldest version of the angelic message, he is well pleased. For what Christianity did many centuries afterwards in the way of informing an art, a poetry of graver and higher beauty, we may think, than that of Greek art and poetry at their best, was in truth conformable to the original tendency of its genius. The genuine capacity of the Catholic Church in this direction, discoverable from the first in the New Testament, was also really at work in that earlier peace under the Antonines, the minor peace of the Church, as we might call it, in distinction from the final peace of the Church, commonly so called, under Constantine. St. Francis, with his following in the sphere of poetry and of the arts, the voice of Dante, the hand of Giotto, giving visible feature and color in a palpable place among men to the regenerate race, did but re-establish a continuity only suspended in part by those troublous intervening centuries, the Dark Ages, properly thus named, with the gracious spirit of the primitive church as manifested in that first early springtide of her success. The greater peace of Constantine, on the other hand, in many ways does but establish the exclusiveness the Puritanism, the ascetic gloom which in the period between Aurelius and the first Christian emperor characterized a church under misunderstanding or oppression, driven back in a world of tasteless controversy inwards upon herself. Already, in the reign of Antoninus Pius, the time was gone by when men became Christians under some sudden and overpowering impression, and with all the disturbing results of such a crisis, at this period the larger number, perhaps, had been born Christians, had been ever with peaceful hearts in their father's house. 
that earlier belief in the speedy coming of judgment and of the end of the world with the consequences it so naturally involved in the temper of men's minds was dying out every day the contrast between the church and the world was becoming less pronounced and now also as the church rested a while from opposition that rapid self-development outward from within proper to times of peace was in progress antoninus pius it might seem more truly even than marcus aurelius himself was of that group of pagan saints for whom dante like augustine had provided in his scheme of the house with many mansions a sincere old roman piety had urged his fortunately constituted nature to no mistakes no offences against humanity and of his entire freedom from guile one reward had been this singular happiness that under his rule there was no shedding of christian blood to him belonged that half humorous placidity of soul of a kind of illustrated later very effectively by montagna which starting with an instinct of mere fairness towards human nature in the world seems at last actually to qualify its possessor to be almost the friend of the people of christ amiable in its own nature and full of a reasonable gaiety christianity has often had its advantage of characters such as that the geniality of antoninus pius like the geniality of the earth itself had permitted the church as being in truth no alien from that old mother earth to expand and thrive for a season as by natural process and that charmed period under the antonines extending to the later years of the reign of aurelius beautiful brief chapter of ecclesiastical history contains as one of its motives of interest the earliest development of christian ritual under the precedence of the church of rome again as in one of those mystical quaint visions of the shepherd of hermas the aged woman was become by degrees more and more youthful and in the third vision she was quite young and radiant with beauty only her hair was that of an aged woman and at the last she was joyous and seated upon a throne seated upon a throne because her position is a strong one the subterranean worship of the church belonged properly to those years of her early history in which it was illegal for her to worship at all but hiding herself for a while as conflict grew violent she resumed when there was felt to be no more than ordinary risk her natural freedom and the kind of outward prosperity she was enjoying in those moments of her first peace her modes of worship now blossoming freely above ground was reinforced by the decision at this point of a crisis in her internal history in the history of the church as throughout the moral history of mankind there are two distinct ideals either of which it is possible to maintain two conceptions under one or the other of which we may represent to ourselves men's efforts toward a better life corresponding to those two contrasted aspects noted above as discernible in the picture afforded by the new testament itself of the character of christ the ideal of asceticism represents moral effort as essentially a sacrifice the sacrifice of one part of human nature to another that it may live the more completely in what survives of it while the ideal of culture represents it as a harmonious development of all the parts of human nature in just proportion to each other it was to the latter order of ideas that the church and especially the church of rome in the age of the antonines freely lent herself in that earlier peace she had set up for herself the ideal of spiritual development under the guidance of an instinct by which in those serene moments she was absolutely true to the peaceful soul of her founder good will to men she said in whom god himself is well pleased for a little while at least there was no forced opposition between the soul and the body the world and the spirit and the grace of graciousness itself was preeminently with the people of christ tact good sense ever the note of a true orthodoxy the merciful compromises of the church indicative of her imperial vocation in regard to all the varieties of human kind with the universality of which the old roman pastorship she was superseding is but a prototype was already become conspicuous in spite of a discredited irritating vindictive society all around her against that divine urbanity and moderation the old error of montanus we read of dimly was a fanatical revolt the old error of montanus we read of dimly was a fanatical revolt sour falsely anti-mundane even with an air of ascetic affectation and a bigoted distaste in particular for all the peculiar graces of womanhood by it the desire to please was understood to come of the author of evil 
in this interval of quietness it was perhaps inevitable by the law of reaction that some such extravagances of the religious temper should arise but again the church of rome now becoming every day more and more completely the capital of the christian world checked the nascent montanism or puritanism of the moment vindicating for all christian people a cheerful liberty of heart against many a narrow group of sectaries all alike in their different ways accusers of the genial creation of god with her full fresh faith in the evangel in a veritable regeneration of the earth and the body and the dignity of man's entire personal being for a season at least at that critical period in the development of christianity she was for reason for common sense for fairness to human nature and generally for what may be called the naturalness of christianity as also for its comely order she would be brought to her king in raiment of needlework it was by the bishops of rome diligently transforming themselves in the true catholic sense into universal pastors that the path of what we must call humanism was thus defined and then in this hour of expansion as if now at last the catholic church might venture to show her outward lineaments as they really were worship the beauty of holiness nay the elegance of sanctity was developed with a bold and confident gladness the like of which has hardly been the ideal of worship in any later age the tables in fact were turned the prize of a cheerful temper on a candid survey of life was no longer with the pagan world the aesthetic charm of the catholic church her evocative power over all that is eloquent and expressive in the better mind of man her outward comeliness her dignifying convictions about human nature all this is abundantly realized centuries later by dante and giotto by the great medieval church builders by the great ritualists like saint gregory and the masters of sacred music in the middle age we may see already in dim anticipation in those charmed moments towards the end of the second century dissipated or turned aside partly through the fatal mistake of marcus aurelius himself for a brief space of time we may discern that influence clearly predominant there what might seem harsh as dogma was already justifying itself as worship according to the sound rule lex orandi lex credendi our creeds are but the brief abstract of our prayer and song the wonderful liturgical spirit of the church her wholly unparalleled genius for worship being thus awake she was rapidly reorganizing both pagan and jewish elements of ritual for the expanding therein of her own new heart of devotion like the institutions of monasticism like the gothic style of architecture the ritual system of the church as we see it in historic retrospect ranks as one of the great conjoint and so to term them necessary products of human mind destined for ages to come to direct with so deep a fascination men's religious instincts it was then already recognizable as a new and precious fact in the sum of things what has been on the whole the method of the church as a power of sweetness and patience in dealing with matters like pagan art pagan literature was even then manifest and has the character of the moderation the divine moderation of christ himself it was only among the ignorant indeed only in the villages that christianity even in conscious triumph over paganism was really betrayed into iconoclasm in the final peace of the church under constantine while there was plenty of destructive fanaticism in the country the revolution was accomplished in the larger towns in a manner more orderly and discreet in the roman manner the faithful were bent less on the destruction of the old pagan temples than on their conversion to a new and higher use and with much beautiful furniture ready to hand they became christian sanctuaries already in accordance with such maturer wisdom the church of the minor peace had adopted many of the graces of pagan feeling and pagan custom as being indeed a living creature taking up transforming accommodating still more closely to the human heart what of right belonged to it in this way an obscure synagogue was expanded into the catholic church gathering from a richer and more varied field of sound that had remained for him those old roman harmonies some notes of which gregory the great centuries later and after generations of interrupted development formed into the gregorian music she was already as we have heard the house of song of a wonderful new music and posy as if in anticipation of the sixteenth century the church was becoming humanistic in an earlier and unimpeachable renaissance 
singing there had been in abundance from the first though often it dared only be of the heart and it burst forth when it might into the beginnings of a true ecclesiastical music the jewish psalter inherited from the synagogue turning now gradually from greek into latin broken latin into italian as the ritual use of the rich fresh expressive vernacular superseded the earlier authorized language of the church through certain surviving remnants of greek in the latter latin liturgies we may still discern a highly interesting intermediate phase of ritual development when the greek and the latin were in combination the poor surely the poor and the children of that liberal roman church responding already in their own vulgar tongue to an office said in the original liturgical greek that hymn sung in the early morning of which pliny had heard was kindling into the service of the mass the mass indeed would appear to have been said continuously from the apostolic age its details as one by one they become visible in later history have already the character of what is ancient and venerable we are very old and ye are young they seem to protest to those who fail to understand them ritual in fact like all other elements of religion must grow and cannot be made grow by the same law of development which prevails everywhere else in the moral as in the physical world as regards this special phase of the religious life however such development seems to have been unusually rapid in the subterranean age which preceded constantine and in the very first days of the final triumph of the church the mass emerges to general view already substantially complete wisdom was dealing as with the dust of creeds and philosophies so also with the dust of outworn religious usage like the very spirit of life itself organizing soul and body out of the lime and clay of the earth in a generous eclecticism within the bounds of her liberty and as by some providential power within her she gathers and serviceably adopts as in other matters so in ritual one thing here another there from various sources gnostic jewish pagan to adorn and beautify the greatest act of worship the world has seen it was thus the liturgy of the church came to be full of consolations for the human soul and destined surely one day under the sanction of so many ages of human experience to take exclusive possession of the religious consciousness tantum ergo sacramentum venerimur cernui and antiquum documentum novo cedit ritui End of chapter 22. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 23 of Marius the Epicurean, Volume 2 by Walter Pater. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. Divine Service. Wisdom hath builded herself a house. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also prepared for herself a table. The more highly favored ages of imaginative art present instances of the summing up of an entire world of complex associations under some single form, like the Zeus of Olympia, or the series of frescoes which commemorate the acts of St. Francis at Assisi, or like the play of Hamlet, or Faust. It was not in an image, or series of images, yet still in a sort of dramatic action, and with the unity of single appeal to eye and ear that marius about this time found all his new impressions set forth regarding what he had already recognized intellectually as for him at least the most beautiful thing in the world to understand the influence upon him of what follows the reader must remember that it was an experience which came amid a deep sense of vacuity in life the fairest products of the earth seemed to be dropping to pieces as if in men's very hands around him how real was their sorrow and his his observation of life had come to be like the constant telling of a sorrowful rosary day after day till as if taking infection from the cloudy sorrow of the mind the eye also the very senses were grown faint and sick and now it happened as with the actual morning on which he found himself a spectator of this new thing the long winter had been a season of unvarying sullenness at last on this day he awoke with a sharp flash of lightning in the earliest twilight in a little while the heavy rain had filtered the air the clear light was abroad and as though the spring had set in with a sudden leap in the heart of things the whole scene around him lay like some untarnished picture beneath a sky of delicate blue under the spell of his late depression marius had suddenly determined to leave rome for a while 
but desiring first to advertise Cornelius of his movements, and failing to find him in his lodgings, he had ventured still early in the day to seek him in the Sicilian villa. Passing through its silent and empty courtyard, he loitered for a moment to admire. Under the clear but immature light of winter morning, after a storm, all the details of form and colour in the old marbles were distinctly visible, and with a kind of severity, or sadness, so it struck him, amid their beauty. In them, and in all other details of the scene, the cypresses, the bunches of pale daffodils in the grass, the curves of the purple hills of Tusculum, with the drifts of virgin snow still lying in their hollows. The little open door through which he passed from the courtyard admitted him into what was plainly the vast lararium, or domestic sanctuary of the Sicilian family, transformed in many particulars, but still richly decorated, and retaining much of its ancient furniture in metalwork and costly stone. The peculiar half-light of dawn seemed to be lingering beyond its hour upon the solemn marble walls, and here, though at the moment in absolute silence, a great company of people was assembled. In that brief period of peace during which the church emerged for a while from her jealously guarded subterranean life, the rigour of an earlier rule of exclusion had been relaxed. And so it came to pass that on this morning Marius saw for the first time the wonderful spectacle, wonderful especially in its evidential power over himself, over his own thoughts, of those who believe. There were not noticeable among those present great varieties of rank, of age, of personal type. The Roman ingenuous, with the white toga and gold ring, stood side by side with his slave, and the air of the whole company was above all a grave one, an air of recollection. Coming thus unexpectedly upon this large assembly, so entirely united in a silence so profound, for purposes unknown to him, Marius felt for a moment as if he had stumbled by chance upon some great conspiracy. Yet that could scarcely be, for the people here collected might have figured as the earliest Hansel, or pattern of a new world, from the very face of which discontent had passed away. Corresponding to the variety of human type there present was the various expression of every form of human sorrow assuaged. What desire, what fulfillment of desire had wrought so pathetically on the features of these ranks of aged men and women of humble condition? Those young men, bent down so discreetly on the details of their sacred service, had faced life and were glad by some science or light of knowledge they had, to which there had certainly been no parallel in the older world. Was some credible message from beyond the flaming rampart of the world, a message of hope, regarding the place of men's souls and their interest? In the sum of things, already mouldering anew their very bodies, and looks, and voices, now and here? At least there was a cleansing and kindling flame at work in them, which seemed to make everything else Marius had ever known look comparatively vulgar and mean. There were the children, above all, troops of children reminding him of those pathetic children's graves like cradles or garden beds he had noticed in his first visit to these places, and they more than satisfied the odd curiosity he had then conceived about them, wondering in what quaintly expressive forms they might come forth into the daylight if awakened from sleep. Children of the catacombs, some but a span long, with features not so much beautiful as heroic, that world of new, refining sentiment having set its seal even on childhood, they retained certainly no stain or trace of anything subterranean this morning in the alacrity of their worship, as ready as if they had been at play, stretching forth their hands, crying, chanting in a resonant voice, and with boldly upturned faces, Christe eleison. For the silence, silence amid those lights of early morning to which Marius had always been constitutionally impressible, as having in them a certain reproachful austerity, was broken suddenly by resounding cries of Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, repeated alternately again and again until the bishop, rising from his chair, made sign that this prayer should cease. But the voices burst out once more presently in richer and more varied melody, though still of an antiphonal character. The men, the women and children, the deacons, the people, answering one another somewhat after the manner of a Greek chorus but again with what a novelty of poetic accent, what a genuine expansion of heart, what profound intimations for the intellect as the meaning of the words grew upon him. Cum grandi effectu et compunctione dicatur, says an ancient Eucharistic order, 
and certainly the mystic tone of this praying and singing was one with the expression of deliverance of grateful assurance and sincerity upon the faces of those assembled as if some searching correction a regeneration of the body by the spirit had begun and was already gone a great way the countenances of men women and children alike had a brightness on them which he could fancy reflected upon himself an amenity a mystic amiability and unction which found its way most readily of all to the hearts of children themselves the religious poetry of those hebrew psalms benedixisti domine terum tuum dixit dominus domino meo sede a dextris meus was certainly in marvellous accord with the lyrical instinct of his own character those august hymns he thought must thereafter ever remain by him as among the well-tested powers and things to soothe and fortify the soul one could never grow tired of them in the old pagan worship there had been little to call the understanding into play here on the other hand the utterance the eloquence the music of worship conveyed as marius readily understood a fact or series of facts for intellectual reception that became evident more especially in those lessons or sacred readings which like the singing and broken vernacular latin occurred at certain intervals among the silence of the assembly there were readings again with bursts of chanted invocation between for fuller light on a difficult path in which many a vagrant voice of human philosophy haunting men's minds from of old recurred with clearer accent than had ever belonged to it before as if it lifted above its first intention into the harmonies of some supreme system of knowledge or doctrine at length complete and last of all came a narrative which with a thousand tender memories every one appeared to know by heart displaying in all the vividness of a picture for the eye the mournful figure of him towards whom this whole act of worship still consistently turned a figure which seemed to have absorbed like some rich tincture in his garment all that was deep felt and impassioned in the experiences of the past it was the anniversary of his birth as a little child they celebrated to-day astaterunt regis terrae so the gradual the song of degrees proceeded the young men on the steps of the altar responding in deep clear antiphone or chorus as to terent regis terrae adversus sanctum puerum tuum jesum nunc domine da servus tuis loci verbum tuum et signa fieri por nomen sancti pueri jesu and the proper action of the rite itself like a half-open book to be read by the duly initiated mind took up those suggestions and carried them forward into the present as having reference to a power still efficacious still after some mystic sense even now in action among the people there assembled the entire office indeed with its interchange of lessons hymns prayer silence was itself like a single piece of highly composite dramatic music a song of degrees rising steadily to a climax notwithstanding the absence of any central image visible to the eye the entire ceremonial process like the place in which it was enacted was weighty with symbolic significance seemed to express a single leading motive the mystery if such in fact it was centred indeed in the actions of one visible person distinguished among the assistants who stood ranged in semicircle around him by the extreme fineness of his white vestments and the pointed cap with the golden ornaments upon his head nor had marius ever seen the pontifical character as he conceived it secret ungentum in capite descendants in orum vestimenti so fully realized as in the expression the manner and voice of this novel pontiff as he took his seat on the white chair placed for him by the young men and received his long staff into his hand or moved his hands hands which seemed endowed in a very deed with some mysterious power at the lavabo or at the various benedictions or to bless certain objects on the table before him chanting in cadence of a grave sweetness the leading parts of the rite what profound unction and mysticity the solemn character of the singing was at its height when he opened his lips like some new sort of rhapsodos it was for the moment as if he alone possessed the words of the office and they flowed anew from some permanent source of inspiration within him the table or altar at which he presided below a canopy on delicate spiral columns was in fact the tomb of a youthful witness of the family of the Cecilii 
who had shed his blood not many years before, and whose relics were still in this place. It was for his sake the bishop put his lips so often to the surface before him, the regretful memory of that death entwining itself, though not without certain notes of triumph, as a matter of special inward significance, throughout a service which was, before all else, from first to last, a commemoration of the dead. A sacrifice also, a sacrifice it might seem like the most primitive, the most natural and enduringly significant of old pagan sacrifices, of the simplest fruits of the earth. And in connection with this circumstance again, as in the actual stones of the building, so in the rite itself, what Marius observed was not so much new matter as a new spirit, moulding and forming with a new intention many observances not witnessed for the first time to-day. Men and women came to the altar successively in perfect order, and deposited below the lattice-work of pierced white marble their baskets of wheat and grapes, incense, oil for the sanctuary lamps, bread and wine especially, pure wheaten bread, the pure white wine of the Tusculan vineyards. There was here a veritable consecration, hopeful and animating, of the earth's gifts, of old dead and dark matter itself now in some way redeemed at last, of all that we can touch or see in the midst of a jaded world that had lost the true sense of such things, and in strong contrast to the wise emperor's renunciant and impassive attitude towards them. Certain portions of that bread and wine were taken into the bishop's hands, and thereafter with an increasing mysticity and effusion the rite proceeded. Still in a strain of inspired supplication the antiphonal singing developed, from this point, into a kind of dialogue between the chief minister and the whole assisting company. Sursum corda, habemus et dominum, gratis agamus domino deo nostra. It might have been thought the business, the duty or service of young men more particularly, as they stood there in long ranks and in severe and simple vesture of the purest white, a service in which they would seem to be flying for refuge, as with their precious, their treacherous and critical youth in their hands to one, yes, one like themselves, who yet claim their worship, a worship above all in the way of Aurelius, in the way of imitation. Adoramus de Christi, Cia percrucum, tuum redemisti mundum, they cry together. So deep is the emotion that at moments it seems to Marius as if some there present apprehend that prayer prevails, that the very object of this pathetic crying himself draws near. From the first there had been the sense, an increasing assurance of one coming, actually with them now, according to the oft-repeated affirmation or petition, Dominus Vobiscum. Some at least were quite sure of it. The confidence of this remnant fired the hearts and gave meaning to the bold ecstatic worship of all the rest about them. Prompted especially by the suggestions of that mysterious old Jewish psalmody so new to him, lesson and hymn, and catching therewith a portion of the enthusiasm of those beside him, Marius could discern dimly behind the solemn recitation which now followed, at once a narrative and a prayer the most touching image truly that had ever come within the scope of his mental or physical gaze. It was the image of a young man giving up voluntarily one by one, for the greatest of ends, the greatest gifts, actually parting with himself above all with the serenity, the divine serenity of his own soul. Yet from the midst of his desolation crying out upon the greatness of his success, as if foreseeing this very worship, as centre of the supposed facts which for these people were become so constraining a motive of hopefulness of activity, that image seemed to display itself with an overwhelming claim on human gratitude. What St. Louis of France discerned, and found so irresistibly touching across the dimness of many centuries, as a painful thing done for love of him by one he had never seen, was to them almost as a thing of yesterday, and their hearts were whole with it. It had the force among their interests of an almost recent event in the career of one whom their father's fathers might have known. From memory so sublime, yet so close at hand, had the narrative descended in which these acts of worship centered, though again the names of some more recently dead were mingled in it. And it seemed as if the very dead were aware, 
to be stirring beneath the slabs of sepulchres which lay so near that they might associate themselves to this enthusiasm to this exalted worship of jesus one by one at last the faithful approached to receive from the chief minister morsels of the great white wheaten cake he had taken into his hands Producat, vas ad vishem aeternum he prays half silently as they depart again after discreet embraces the eucharist of those early days was even more entirely than at any later or happier time an act of thanksgiving and while the remnants of the feast are borne away for the reception of the sick the sustained gladness of the rite reaches its highest point in the singing of a hymn a hymn like the spontaneous product of two opposed militant companies contending accordingly together heightening accumulating their witness provoking one another's worship in a kind of sacred rivalry ite misa est cried the young deacons and marius departed from that strange scene along with the rest what was it was it this made the way of cornelius so pleasant through the world as for marius himself the natural soul of worship in him had at last been satisfied as never before he felt as he left that place that he must hereafter experience often a longing memory a kind of thirst for all this over again and it seemed moreover to define what he must require of the powers whatsoever they might be that had brought him into the world at all to make him not unhappy in it End of chapter 23. This recording is in the public domain.